You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop is made possible in part by grants from Springpoint Partners and the Walton Family Foundation. Waterloop. Hi, this is Travis with Waterloop. If you've listened to this podcast before, you've heard me talk about High Sierra showerheads. I am such a big fan of them for their water efficiency, for the powerful spray they provide, their solid metal construction, no plastic parts involved, and how they're made in the USA. But there are some other great recommendations on High Sierra Showerheads. Let me share these with you. They are named Best Showerhead by Popular Science. They are named Best Showerhead by CNET. High Sierra Showerheads also gets named Best Low Flow Showerhead by Wirecutter, Treehugger, and CNN Underscored. You can also look on Amazon and see that they get tons of high star reviews from all the satisfied customers. You can get 20% off using promo code LOOP20 at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. You're in the Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. For this episode, going to be talking with Nicole Lampy. She is Managing Director of the Water Hub at Climate Nexus. Nicole, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about water. So we're going to talk all all about the opportunity of water. We'll get into that and what that means in a a minute. But before we launch down that path, um, could you explain to folks uh, what the Water Hub is? I would love to. Um, The Water Hub is a relatively new program that's housed at a nonprofit called Climate Nexus. And we like to say that we're a free communication shop for the water movement. We provide behind the scenes hands-on help um, as well as research and training to water advocates and experts that are working to improve access to water, improve water safety, um, you know, secure the funding that we need to address our water challenges and, and basically working on the water challenges of our time. There's a, there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of people working on that. So that's awesome that you have basically like these free resources to help people with communications uh, aspects. And so where can people go to, to check that out and connect with you all? They can find us on waterhub.org. Um, we're also on Twitter at water underscore hub. Cool. Twitter. I think that's how I cross paths with you originally. Anyway, Indeed. it's like it's like the new it's the new social square, <laughs> right? It is the it is the water cooler of the internet for sure. <laughs> I like that. Um, all right, so this this report and this work you all have done called the opportunity of water. Um, I'm just going to let you describe it instead of myself trying to do so. What what is this all about? Well, over the past, I would say, 18 months. It, it felt to us like water was getting more attention than ever. Um, we see it, you know, in, in sort of uh, national politics with President Biden focusing on lead pipes and his infrastructure push. We've seen more water news than ever about droughts and flooding across the country. And we've also seen this growing focus on longstanding issues like affordability and shutoffs during the pandemic. Um, thanks to their increasing urgency, but also thanks to a lot of deep and, and, you know, decades old organizing. Um, But the hard thing is that this moment of awareness has come up at a time when elected officials, advocates, and funders are all in triage mode. Mm. Water isn't the only thing on our minds. Um, But we did see this, this thread in which water connects the dots between a lot of timely topics like climate change, COVID prevention, racial justice, and economic recovery, which you'll probably recall were President Biden's four initial priorities. Um, So we had this feeling at the Water Hub that this was like our moment. And we heard similar things from leaders like EPA Waters' Radica Fox, um, Colette Pichon Battle from Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, and and lots of other thought leaders in the field. Um, And so we spent months asking our partners which range from community-based organizations um, to scientists to national nonprofits, what do they need in this moment and how can communications help? Mm. And we heard a few themes um, in those conversations. We heard that the press has a short attention span. And so 
while, you know, we get these spikes of, of activity or of awareness when, for instance, a storm happens or when, you know, a new report comes out, um, things quickly move on. And that's particularly true in this moment of overlapping crises. Um, we heard that it's time to let the front lines lead, um, <clears throat> that the groups closest to the ground have historically not had a lot of communications capacity, but they have a lot of, of information and, um, and a lot of connections that can actually help us shift the root causes of our current challenges. We also heard this really um, tough challenge in that everyone's straddling these two time horizons, right? There's like the near-term needs and opportunities, like things that are moving right now in state legislatures and, you know, utilities at, at the federal level. But there's also like the longer term systems and culture change that is needed to actually prevent problems rather than just, you know, cleaning them up after the fact. Um, and so we developed this, um, this report. Um, there are actually two versions, one for funders and, and nonprofits and then one for policymakers that sort of distilled what we've been hearing and learning. It includes some media analysis, um, some polling synthesis, and then um, a lot of, a lot of insights from conversations that we've been having with water leaders about basically how, how can we capitalize on this moment of awareness to actually make real progress. Mm. <clears throat> I love how you, you mentioned that there's kind of this moment for water, right? Right now, there's this opportunity. Um, I think people that have worked in water or around water um, have been trying to get to this moment <laughs> for a while, right? With all of their communications activities and their advocacy activities, it's been trying to get uh, to this to this moment of heightened awareness and of opportunity to actually kind of break through. Um, could you talk maybe about some of that work, how like the organizing efforts of the past decade, decades have kind of set the stage for this to finally, uh, finally be happening? Yeah, absolutely. Um, groups on the ground, and I'll, I'll, I'll name a couple of specific examples in a moment, have been working for, as you said, years and decades to, to bring awareness to water issues, to cultivate community leaders, and to lay the groundwork for policy progress. Um, I'm thinking about organizing, for instance, in the Central Valley of California, where I grew up, um, where groups like Community Water Center, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, Clean Water Action, and many others have been working on, you know, contaminated drinking water, on problems like drying wells, on infrastructure gaps, and more for years. And and are you know are starting have been actually over the past several years to pass policies and really see them through the implementation process to ensure that that solutions reach the communities that need them most. Um, I'm thinking about groups like the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus, co-chaired by PolicyLink and the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, which connects groups across the country, but also across issues, which is really important, right? We don't want to be competing with climate colleagues, for instance, or with health groups. We want to be pushing together for something that serves everyone. Um, and then there are a bunch of regional collaboratives in places like the Colorado River, the Delaware River Basin, the Great Lakes, Chesapeake Bay, the Gulf Coast, um, that recognize that like the, the sort of like natural challenges um, at, don't like they <laughs> they don't um, align with political boundaries, and so we have to work together across state lines, um, across utility districts and river basins to actually solve them. Um, and the relationships and infrastructure within those networks are really needed now, um, but they take care and feeding every day. Um, so while the like the moments of opportunity may happen like in the legislative session or when we have the right people in leadership in Washington D.C., we can't wait until those moments to actually build the connective tissue. And that's the that's the thing that we wanted to like lift up in this moment is that we're resting on, we're like standing on the shoulders of a lot of these decades old efforts right now. And we have to do more of them. Mm. I love the way you put that. Absolutely. Um, one of the, the key areas with all of this is, well, how does it resonate with elected officials? How does, how does water fit with elected officials? Uh, are they all going to go for some of these changes or some of these investments, whatever it might be? Uh, I know that there's been a lot of work that goes into 
polling and analyzing this. Um, and it and it turns out that water is a political winner, if you will. Could you explain that why why it is how it is um, and what and, and what info you have to to support that? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with my sort of like personal connection. Sure. Um, look, we all drink water. We all <laughs> cook with it, brush our teeth with it, bathe, etc. And and we know from polling that a lot of people feel like a, a deep personal connection to their local rivers, streams, lakes, etc. Um, as I said, I grew up in the Central Valley of California in a town called Merced, um, and I grew up fishing and floating the Merced River and picnicking and learning to swim alongside an irrigation reservoir called Lake Yosemite, which at the time I didn't even know it was a man-made lake. Like I just, huh. I just thought this was a place to cool <laughs> off and hang out with friends in the summer. Um, I also grew up on a well, and I remember like funky tastes and our water being brown and being embarrassed when my friends came over and noticing the smell at various times of year. Um, when water isn't clean, it's impossible to ignore, right? Um, and when it is, it's something that like that like is is good, a good and like sweet part of our lives. Mm. Um, and we see this like personal connection show up in the polling. The Water Hub has has done a number of polls ourselves, working with Climate Nexus and Yale and George Mason University, but there are groups like Public Policy Institute of California, U.S. Water Alliance, um, Rocky Mountain. Sorry, it's Rocky Mountain College. Um, that that pull water routinely, as well as like the Associated Press, which pulls environmental mm. issues annually. And and what all of this research shows is that water is a top environmental concern for people from all walks of life and both political parties. Um, it basically, while a lot of issues in the environment have gotten really politicized, water remains really bipartisan. Um, <clears throat> and in addition to asking, like, how much do people care about water versus things like, you know, education or health care or the economy, we've also asked a lot of really specific questions about what sorts of investments do you support? What sorts of programs and policies do you support? And it's really encouraging. Um, huge majorities of voters want the government to spend more on water. They want to ensure universal access. They want to make it affordable for everyone. And, and they recognize that the right solutions are things like conservation and efficiency, nature-based infrastructure, et cetera. Basically, what, what I've seen in the polling suggests that the electorate is already there, mm -hmm. there on board with what most of the Water Hub's partners want to push in terms of solutions. Um, and so it feels like the, the real, like the, the next step is to keep this issue on the radar of decision makers who are stretched across a lot of issues and to get to alignment on like, what do we tackle first? Um, which, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of um, consistency, but there's also a, a decent spectrum of, of what people think we ought to prioritize. And I think that's really an opportunity for funders to act as conveners and to help to like lift up shared priorities. Hmm. Love it. We'll talk about maybe some of your recommendations for funders and advocates here in a second. But, um, <clears throat> you know, there's this kind of, swelling of of support for water issues um there's even a lot more chatter i see and hear about water as a a right water as a human right just that that this is something that everyone should have clean reliable water and sanitation um i just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that shift in perception um that that kind of increasing stance that you hear out there that, you know, water isn't really a privilege. It's not just something you have to pay for or, you know, whatever, but this is, this is a necessary part of, of, <clears throat> you know, the, something yeah. that should be given to everybody. Yeah. What are your thoughts right. on that? Um, I don't know that it's new hmm. that people think everyone should have access to water, which is like a basic necessity. Um, what I think is new is that people are starting to notice the difference between what we all agree ought to be accessible to everyone and what the reality is in communities. You know, for the past hundred years, white and wealthy folks have taken safe water and sanitation for granted. Um, you know, they've had it. And so they haven't had to pay a whole lot of attention. Um, <clears throat> and, and thanks to a lot of the groups that we were talking about before, all of a sudden it's been put on our radar that not everyone can take water for granted. And in particular, that Black and Indigenous communities are more likely to be exposed to things like lead, 
They're more likely to lack running water or flush toilets, more likely to have water service shut off for, um, for non-payment and a whole bunch of other issues. And <clears throat> so with this understanding that water isn't in fact available to everyone right now, I think there has been this really smart and strategic push from the water justice movement to frame it as a human right, to really lift this up as a failure of government to deliver on you know, one of its fundamental responsibilities to the public um, and to ensure that this thing, which is actually like a public good, isn't just sold for profit, but that it's actually delivered to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like it's really, the rhetoric is really encouraging. The increased attention is really encouraging. What's discouraging is that some of these gaps are actually growing right now. Um, and so we have to, we have to like bring the policies and the programs up to speed with what people are saying. Uh, I, I love how you kind of corrected or clarified me there that this, this idea has been around, but maybe some of the events of the past five years, some of the news that's been out there, you know, certainly what happened in Flint and then people learning about the, the million people in California that don't have access to clean, reliable drinking water. And so it's just this education that's happened um, has, has led people to really call for, for more water equity. Um, what about coronavirus, COVID, um, our favorite topic of the day, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, what role has this played in creating a moment of opportunity for water? Yeah, I think it's played a huge role. Um, we've known for a long time that water is essential to public health, right? It's the reason that we treat water. It's the reason that we flush our toilets and, and, the, um, and the waste is taken away from our homes and streets and rivers. Um, but coronavirus put that on, on our minds or in front of us in a new way. Um, you know, with all the emphasis on and hand washing and the fact that like clean water and, and cleanliness actually save lives, we suddenly couldn't ignore the fact that not everyone has access. Um, our partners at Community Water Center and, and a whole lot of other folks have used this really powerful language um, around water as basic personal protective equipment, which I love because, you know, it, it really is like, you know, we talk about gloves and masks and vaccines, and those are all really powerful technologies. But water for hand washing and water for staying hydrated and healthy is also life saving. Um, <clears throat> and so, groups that have been working on a range of water access issues, everything from you know rising rates, which are way outpacing inflation, and putting water service out of reach for a lot of families in a lot of places. Um, things like infrastructure gaps, the homelessness crisis, contamination with lead, arsenic, nitrates, a whole range of other contaminants, um, that these actually prevent people from staying safe and healthy. Um, and, and so with this awareness, we, we saw some short-term progress, right? We saw water shutoff stop in a lot of cities, a lot of states, and a lot of utilities across the country. We also saw for the first time the federal government helping people pay their water bills. Mm -hmm. um, that was included in a couple of COVID relief packages, including one that passed under President Trump. Um, these are all good steps forward, but they're also sort of short term. Um, mm -hmm. And so the real work continues to ensure that everyone can count on water. Um, one of the big pushes that our partners are working on right now is establishing the nation's first permanent federal program to help people pay their water bills. We do this for other services like energy, but we haven't done it on water for a long time. And I think, again, that's in part because water just flies under the radar for those of us that have it. Mm. Great, great points. One of the things that the Opportunity of Water talks about that you all talk about is, is meeting the moment. And we talked about the moment earlier, um, that we are at this moment. What, what does it mean to meet the moment? Yeah. I mean, a couple of things come to mind for me, but I also want to acknowledge that there's like, a, there's a difference of opinion here. Mm, sure. So one of the things that I want to call out is just meeting people's basic needs right now. That's everything from, you know, mutual aid efforts in places like the Navajo Nation and the Warm Springs Reservation here in Oregon, where I live now. 
um, to like mobile hand washing stations that were put in the streets for people experiencing homelessness in cities across the country. So we've seen this like groundswell of, um, of like community driven solutions. Um, but we can't, we can't just rely on that. We need to resource that, but we also need to get the government involved. Um, and that means pushing through programs and policies that prevent these kinds of problems in the first place. Um, and that like, that are responsive to needs on the ground. Um, and, and here's where the difference of opinion comes up, right? Because there are some groups that are more oriented to like what's achievable now, like let's get the infrastructure bill as strong as possible and make sure that it has enough money for water and that the implementation gets the funds to places that need it most. But there's also groups, I was just on a call this morning, a press call with, um, with frontline groups about Hurricane Ida that aren't just focused on tomorrow's needs or today's needs. They're talking about like <laughs> radical transformation, right? They're talking about getting out of an extractive economy where polluters that harm communities continue <laughs> to have a lot more power than the people and actually like changing the way that we make decisions and the way that we distribute resources and the way that we live on this earth. And I think that there, like we need to do both, as I was talking about in working on these two different time horizons, like those frontline voices and that sort of like radical vision for what the future could be. We need that because the current system created these problems and it's not going to fix them for the long term. Mm. Yeah. Great, great points. <clears throat> One of the things I like about your, your work is that you make uh, recommendations for action, things that people can do to to meet this moment, to seize this opportunity. Um, so let's let's kind of look at two buckets there. You make recommendations for funders and for advocates. Um, let's start with the the funders bucket. What do you recommend they they do? Um, well, the first thing is just investing in grassroots groups that are rooted in impacted communities. Um, mm. Those are a lot of our partners and it's become really clear to us like how powerful they are and how innovative they are and how under-resourced they are. Um, and there seems to be like broad agreement that we need to um, we need to diversify the water movement, the environmental movement, that we need more and different voices. That means that we need to be resourcing the groups that haven't been part of the conversation. Um, I also think that we need long-term funding, right? Um, not just for this um, for this legislative push, but multi-year general general operating support grants so that we can actually, as I said, build and maintain like the relationships and infrastructure. Um, we need to invest in journalism and communications. Um, you know, the the journalism world has been like the the news media has been shrinking for years, and we saw like a huge amount of layoffs and furloughs and consolidations um, in the early days of the pandemic. And, and with that means that we have less capacity to actually cover what's happening in communities. There are a lot of news deserts that are also places where like water problems are most acute. Um, and so we need to be like keeping eyes on those places so that we can actually facilitate change there. Mm. Um, one other thing that I want to name, I alluded to this earlier, is just like helping to connect the dots between climate and health and water. I think often funders, program areas are siloed, and that ends up being reflected in the nonprofits that they resource, and then it also ends up being reflected in our communications and then in our policy pushes. Um, and it's just like we end up drowning each other out instead of uh, talking with one voice. Mm. Um, and then the last thing is, as I said, acting as conveners to help build relationships among organizations and across coalitions. The great recommendations. I'm obviously like to hear the one about uh, communications, the importance of that and, and storytelling sure. and, and uh, sharing information and all that good stuff. Um, the other, the other one category I mentioned advocates. Uh, what do you recommend that advocates do to help meet this moment for water? Um, I mean, I like we're so inspired. I should say the same thing about funders. Like, I really see funders stepping up to meet this mm. moment, and I would say the same of nonprofits. Um, so, really, like the things that I'm calling out are things that we're seeing that are working. Um, one thing, uh, you know, on the advocacy front is talking about water in terms people can connect to their lives. Don't sanitize this stuff with technical and legal language. Um, it's not only like sort of inaccessible to a lot of people, but it doesn't. It doesn't locate water in their lives in a way that like water is really present for them. Um, similarly, you know, water 
touches our homes. It touches our health. It touches our family. It touches our safety. And, and we need to be like speaking to those values. Um, and while the water hub and a lot of what I've said so far today is like focused on people, um, which have, you know, for, for many years when I first started working on environment, like maybe weren't as, as centered in the water space as they could be. Like we shouldn't forget about the environmental stakes here. People absolutely care about healthy waterways, healthy rivers. They care about fish. They care about wildlife. They care about forests. Um, and so we need to talk about both and we need to acknowledge the interdependence between people and nature. Mm. Um, another thing, like I'm a writer, right? I love words, um, mm. but words sometimes aren't the best way to touch people's hearts. And so I, I, we've been encouraging our partners and challenging ourselves um, to reach beyond tools like fact sheets and op-eds and use more video, use more podcasts, um, you know, text, arts, events, um, like ways to help people feel in to this issue. Um, another thing that I want to call out is, um, is being mindful about messengers. Um, you know, reporters have their go-to sources that are like the, you know, the, the sort of high profile institutional, um, scientists and, um, and, you know, elected leaders or utility leaders and big green groups. Um, and sometimes when you get a call as, um, an expert, you ought to refer it to someone else that's closest to the issue. Um, and relatedly, because I was just on this Hurricane Ida um, climate justice call, I want to talk about like the timing of communications after a crisis. Um, you know, we've had so many this year and, and know that more are to come. And it's really tempting, um, you know, when, when all eyes are on, for instance, water shutoffs or floods or, um, you know, drought and drying rivers and wells to, um, for the advocates that are like pushing policies to jump in and raise their hands and say, this is the solution we need to move now. Um, but in the immediate aftermath, um, that's a time to center information, fundraising and relief needs. And so I think, you know, it, it used to be that we would like seed space and now disasters are overlapping and it can feel like open season mm. on crisis communications. And I just want to encourage advocates to be really mindful about like what's needed now by the people who are most impacted and, and how can we be respectful um, of those needs. Um, and, I, and I also want to plug, because we've been thinking a lot about this and trying to figure it out for ourselves, that we're going to be hosting a roundtable discussion about disaster communications and basically like how can we leverage moments of awareness, but also do it in a way that's like constructive and respectful and human and trauma informed. Um, mm -hmm. And so happy to share information about that with your listeners. Um, when we have it, it's likely going to happen in October. Fantastic. Well, Nicole, I am, uh, this is like a wealth of information, Ter <laughs> terrific, terrific in, uh, ideas, advice, perspective, um, really motivational, um, really inspiring. Um, where do you, where do you stand at the end of the day on the scale of optimism, you know, for this, for meeting this moment, for meeting this opportunity for water? Cause like I said, so many people that have worked in water, environment like yourself have been working toward this, trying to get the attention for so long. Um, and we're here. Um, how, how do you feel about that? What's your, what's your feeling towards actually meeting this moment? Um, you know, it depends on the day. Um, <laughs> this summer I've, I've had some time to like drive through central California where I grew up and then drive through central Oregon where I now live now and like, it hurts my heart to see like rivers that are dry, rivers that are covered with green slime, to see smoke in the air and, you know, hillsides that were always green now like brown mm -hmm. or burnt. Um, so, you know, I worry like a lot of other people, but I also feel really hopeful seeing like the organizing that's happening, um, seeing the number of people in positions of power that are paying attention and that are like deeply committed to not only doing this, but doing it differently. Um, and, and like, and young people are blowing my mind. <laughs> um, I get really excited when like my daughter is seven and she's already learning about environmental issues. They're already talking about climate 
talking about like how they can be good, good, like, um, you know, <laughs> inhabitants of planet Earth. And that makes me feel really hopeful about the future. Yeah, they are up to bat next. It's uh, hard to imagine, but it's, it's the truth. Um, well, yes. you know, credit to you and, and everyone at Waterhub and, and Climate Nexus for the resources that you're putting out there and just that, that direct assistance to these groups um, in an area that's so desperately needed, communications and, and advocacy. So, yeah, appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for, for having us. Yeah, and, and it's an honor to get to do this work, really. Yeah. Waterloop. Thanks, everyone, for listening to today's episode. A special thanks to Waterloop supporters, Springpoint Partners, and the Walton Family Foundation. The Waterloop Podcast is sponsored by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart, stylish way to save energy, water, and money while enjoying a powerful shower. Use promo code LOOP20 for 20% off at highsierrashowerheads.com. If you like Waterloop, Please subscribe to the YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on social media and visit waterloop.org to sign up for updates.